All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm glad to be visiting here this morning. My name is Richard Church. Uh, a lot of you have met me before. I think I think the last time I was here was maybe a year ago. Um, and I lead a, a ministry called Grace Beyond Borders International. Pastor Ray asked me if I'd just uh, give a short update at the beginning here this morning, and I'm happy to do that. Um, by the way, I, I, I think some of the young people uh, here in your church have become pen pals with uh, the children of uh, one of our missionary families in the Philippines. And um, that's always a, a, a good thing to have that connection and for the missionaries to know that people are thinking about them here. Um, we, have, we have 11 missionaries in five countries. All right, so our mission fields are uh, mostly in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, a a country that I won't mention the name of it, Um, Thailand. uh, We do have uh, work in Papua New Guinea as well, uh, and then in West Africa, in Nigeria. And i just just give you a quick update on a couple of things going on in a few of our mission fields um, in, in the country that I won't mention. Uh, a couple of our missionaries, we call them Paul and Sarah to sort of protect their identities. But uh, Paul and Sarah were here in the U.S. for uh, about six months. Uh, we didn't get an opportunity to come and, and visit here, but... Uh, they visited a lot of churches around the country, and that was their first time. They're not Americans. Uh, that was their first time coming here to the U.S. and uh, visiting Grace churches, meeting Grace believers, and uh, that was a, a, a very good thing uh, for their ministry there in the, in the country where they are at. They're getting ready. They're there back in their uh, country where they minister, but they're getting ready to go to the Philippines for a couple of months and, and visit family and things before then they uh, go, go back to their country for a, a period of several years. Uh, so definitely keep them in prayer. Uh, also, our, our mission field in Nigeria. Uh, I've, I've gone there to Nigeria four times now, and we've held conferences and, and preached in churches there. Our missionaries there are Princeton and Dorcas Waters. Uh, they're in the city of Jos, Nigeria, which is in what's called the Middle Belt. Uh, you know, Nigeria in the far north and especially the northeast, uh, there are a lot of uh, Muslim extremist groups. Uh, the Middle Belt, there is frequent violence of Muslims against Christians. Uh, that's something that they, they deal with on pretty much uh, an everyday basis. About every week, it seems like, uh, there's some kind of an attack uh, against Christians there. Uh, there are not many grace churches in Nigeria. Uh, there are a, a couple that have been planted now, and there's sort of a, a wider group of pastors that are learning the grace message. And there seems to be, you know, sort of the, what, what I tell people here is if you, if you imagine kind of the, the most extreme Pentecostal charismatic church that you know of, you know, every town kind of has that church that is the really, the really extreme uh, charismatic church, that's kind of the norm in the Nigerian churches. But it seems like there are uh, growing numbers of people that are becoming disillusioned with that and are really just looking for sound Bible teaching. And um, there's a lot of things that have been happening in Nigeria that are concerning. Uh, They recently had a presidential election and uh, the, the result of that election was not um, probably a very good thing, certainly for the Christians there in the country. Uh, they've had problems, uh, problems with their currency, uh, problems with gasoline shortages, uh, lots of different, different problems there. Uh, but the ministry is going on there. And uh, so certainly keep them 
in prayer. And uh, I'd be happy, you know, if you have questions about any of our other mission fields or, or anything else that Grace Beyond Borders is doing, I'd be happy to to talk with you before you leave today. But uh, thank you, Ray, for those few minutes just to, to share a few updates. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, everybody's here is here. First announcements. Now you notice Debbie isn't here today. I came by myself. I'm a big boy. You know? First of all, Trish, this is the last time. It's this Thursday, right? Okay. Ladies' night out, 530, March 16th at the Mandarin House on Edison Street, respond to Trish. Okay. Some other annou announcements here. Um, we need to take down the chairs and tables today. Uh, walking in here, the place was a mess. There was all kind of coffee spilled all along here, and you know, so the last group didn't do too well with that. Um, Debbie is not here today. She's teaching on Hannah at Sherwood. They have, you know, Cynthia told her it's the last time I'll schedule you for a Sunday, but that's what they're doing there, and they're also going to do a mailing for the July conference like we did here for the April conference. So her title is Hannah, How Did She Do It? And uh, we neglected to announce that next Saturday, which would be the 18th, this Saturday, is the annual Southside Conference in Chicago. Now, there's one paper over there that's multicolored there. There's the address. And if you want to go there, that's Art Johnson's church. They're at uh, 1250 West 119th Street. So that's pretty far south side from 9 till 5 on Saturday. Debbie and I are usually there. We, we run the table, the book table. The theme is we preach Christ in an exposition of Philippians. So you can get the address there if you're interested or the phone number. And let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the time allowed to preach your word. Amen. Now, in everything, give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18. I'm going to do a short synopsis here, and then we're going to go on to quenching the spirit. So, we've been learning a lot of things about behavior, about churches, about, about us and all that. And we're also, also preaching on another topic every third week on prayer, which is vitally essential. And we've talked about that little voice inside of you that you talk to yourself with. Well, talk to God, and, you know, instead of something that somebody else. Talk to him about your problems. And if that's, you're communicating with God. And the Holy Spirit, you're going to find out, is the connection to do that. So, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. So, in the Old Testament, we learn a, a, an important truth with David's three mighty men. Now, I'm not going to read this passage because of time. But I'll, start, I'll begin in 2 Samuel 23, verse 13 through 15. And three of the thirty chiefs went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. The cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. Now, they were in a, in a war. David's in an exile. He's not the king. He's in, he's in a cave. The cave, Adullam means judgment. You see there, it means judgment. And they came in at harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in, in an hold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed, and he said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. He was thirsty. And, you know, he had a, he couldn't, he couldn't go because of the Philistines. Now, this is a description of the events when David was in the cave. David is, is a fallen king in the hands of his enemies. He is not on the throne, but in exile in a cave. He's holed up there looking for water to satisfy him. 
he was thirsty. Three of his mighty men went to get water for them. They sacrificed themselves. I mean, they had to go through the, they had to get past the Philippines without being killed. Uh, Philistines, I'm talking, I'm not, Philistines, not the Philippines. <laughs> Richard, um, they had to get past that line of the Philistines and uh, get water out of the, well, in Bethlehem by the gate. Um, let me see here. The three mighty men went and got the water. David said, this water is too precious for me to consume. It took, it took a lot to get that water, didn't it? They had to go to bed and pay the whatever they, paid, they had to pay. They had to get through the Philistines line. They had to go to the well, pay whatever the cost was, and bring it back to David. David mused that one should go. And when you read this passage here, you'll see that. But three men went as one man with one purpose. The three mighty men were Abishai, Abishai, that's verse 18, Benaniah, verse 20, and Eleazar, verse 9. Abishai means the father of the gift. Benaniah means son of God. Eleazar means God is my helper. So here is the father of the gift, the son of God, and my helper. The three went as one. This is their trinity now. Okay? Now read, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, read and compare what Paul says in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him. Remember the accent I put on that? Us in him, um, not salvation, be but the but preaching of the Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the dispensation of grace. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should... Be holy and without blame before him in love. Okay? Verse 7. Now that's the Father. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now there's, there's the Son. We have redemption through his blood. Verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Believing is not a work, Romans 4 or 5, we know that. But they had, to, they had to believe to get sealed, okay? Verse 14 and, and 12 and 6 says, to the praise of his glory three times, according to the mystery of his will. Verse, verse 9, uh, um, let me see here. Having made, verse 9, having been made, made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Okay? So you got the Godhead, three in one. They all act as one and purpose together. The mighty men go to the well, pay whatever the price, and retrieve the life-giving water. They get it. They bring it back to David. He says, this is simply too precious for me to consume Simply for himself. And he pours it out for an offering. He pours it to the ground. In scripture, when you pour out the drink offering, it's called the libation. This is thanks, a thanksgiving offering. Free will. Saying, I am going to give it back to the Lord. This is what thanksgiving is all about. Christ, is, as, as you know, Rick said, he did it all. It's not I, but Christ. He's in you. All three persons of the Godhead are in you. They're working in you. Uh, we're going to go on to the Holy Spirit right after this. But he, 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 he just, this is what Thanksgiving is. For you and me, in everything, give thanks. We are like David in the cave of Adullam. We're overthrown. He was overthrown, outcast, and undone. And yet our trinity of mighty men have worked in our behalf. 
providing the grace and the redemption and the sealing that we need. Remember last week. Remember, it is the Lord who is your shield and the Lord who is your exceeding great reward. Now we're going to start on points to spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 and 21. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now this is the new group of thinking. We studied in verses 12 to 15, leadership, the assembly, and the doctrine working in the inner man. Quench not the spirit. Do not put off the fire of the Holy Spirit working. The Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as, as like, symbolized like a fire in Scripture. How is the Holy Spirit going to be quenched? How can you quench the Holy Spirit? How can you put out that fire? Do think, you think water would help? We're talking sim symbolically now. Remember that woman that came here, and she was in she was she was uh, midlife, and we were at the other place, and she came in here and she she said she was spirit filled and born again at five years old. Okay. Do you believe that? I tried like the Dickens to get her to talk to her about can a person lose their salvation. She avoided me all the time. Finally, one morning, it was overcast like this. She said, yeah, you can lose your salvation. Now, guess what I said to her? I said, well, you're not saved. I mean, if you think you can lose your salvation, you must think you're, you have to do something in order to get saved. Or, you know, do something all the time. I said, you're, you're, Satan's, you're Satan's helper right now. Do you think that made her happy? No, I, I told her, I wasn't nasty. I said, you're, you're helping the devil. If you say you can lose your salvation, God says she can. Oh, did she get mad? She walked out the door, and I started preaching. Here she comes back again. And she came in, and this, you know, we had to get the police. And she just started saying, you know, yelling at me. Who do you think you are? And I'm like, well, lady, who do you think you are? We're supposed to have some comfort of the scripture. Why are you trying to take away that comfort? What comfort do we have in this present evil world? We have momentary comfort, our family, kids, and you know, all that. But, you know, we're still living here and we're, all this stuff is going on in the world. You know, Richard mentioned Nigeria. We had that Andrew guy that came here for a long time, uh, for a while. And um, he was in a Christian school. He was a pharmacist, by the way. Four boys he had with his wife. And I started talking to him about the mystery, and one day he finally got it. I said, you don't have to pay a tuition for this. You're going to get it for free. <laughs> he was happy. And, you know, and he was telling everybody, and then he wasn't on too good a terms with his wife, so he was living alone. But, you know, anyway, I, I miss him. He took a, uh, he went to the Philippines, Richard, by the way, and, and did some, uh, he, he was a pharmacist, he did some medical work to help some people in the Philippines while he was here. Okay, where was they at? No. So how do you put out the fire? Well, you can test all things against the word. How is the Holy Spirit going to be quenched? Despise not prophesying. Despise not the teaching of his word. So instead, verse 20, one, prove all things. Prove it. Test it against the word. Okay? Hold fast to that which is good. Follow 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Follow after charity. And by the way, did that woman show any charity? Didn't I show her a lot of charity all the time she was there? And the one moment I realized that she thinks she can lose it, if you're teaching that to people, you're, you are helping the devil. And, well, people who think there's something with, with the, the Bible are nothing compared.
compared to what we read off of the scripture. It's Christ that gets the credit for everything. It was Christ that made me not be angry with that woman or show any anger. It wasn't me. It was Christ. I'm thinking in my mind, i got to hold on to see what she finally believes, what she really believes. And that one morning she said, yeah, you can lose your salvation. Well, I've been waiting, you know, to hear that because that's what I thought she believed in. But she, she, she just, you know, tricked me. She, she didn't do it until that one day. And then she gets angry, you know. Now, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that she may prophesy. Prophecy is one of the most more excellent gifts and the ability to impart edification to the church. I'm going to be talking about that a little later. The gift of healing only helps people who are sick. Now, who didn't show up last week that was sick? A lot of people, a couple of people, maybe. We've had COVID and all that in the, in the church, and we've been, uh, well, the ability to impart edification to the church. The gift of tongues, those who understood the language are helped. Because it was a known language. So there had to be an interpreter to interpret that. Thursday, I'll tell you about, somebody asked me about phone calls. Thursday, let me see. I had a call, I won't mention names, from a couple that have been here before. And he's talking about his own son, who's 50-something, okay? And, you know, you never stop loving your kids. And the father's at odds with him. He, he bangs, they bang heads together because he says he thinks he's saved. The father said he thinks his son is saved, but he, he doesn't want to come to this truth because he wants to go other places. Maybe he wants to be Pentecostal or, you know, I don't know. He only thinks there's one church in the Bible or only one gospel. We know that that's not true. And we know that's what get people angry when we tell them that. What gospel saved you? Can you say the name of it? Can you show me the verse? What church do you belong to? There's a church in the wilderness. Did you belong to that? Oh, you won't live in that then. Okay, what about, what about Matthew 16, 18? Peter's church. Okay, that's the, the Messianic church. That was for Jews only. No, what about Paul's church, the body of Christ? Where there's no Jew or Gentile, male, female, bond, or free. So, <clears throat> the result of talking to them, and you know, he says, can you show me a passage, go to First uh, Timothy chapter 4, where it tells you what, what to eat, what not to eat. Let me see here. First Timothy chapter 4. And I said to this guy, listen, we're in the winter of our lives, and how do you want to be remembered by your children? Do you want to remember them to remember you, remember you as somebody that couldn't be approached or that argued all the time? You don't have to win every talk or every argument. You don't have to get them, force them to, 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 to understand this. The best way you can get to them is change your dealings with them, your interactions with them. Don't respond this way. Don't respond this way, but respond this way. Do you have enough charity in you to do that? Again, how do you want to be remembered by your children? Very important question. And I brought him to this verse. I gave him a lot of other verses. Now the Spirit, verse 1, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. He says, well, that pretty well answers his question. Okay? Because he had some hang up there. So I'm trying to give him some verses and some some understanding, but the main thing is that, hey, admit that you're old now. 
you're in the winter of your years. You don't know how much time you have left. The other call I had, which was, uh, I don't know if it was Saturday or Thursday or Friday, I can't remember. The guy, I've, I've talked to maybe six times before, and he's originally from Puerto Rico. And his accent isn't hard enough, I can, I can still understand it, because I, I get thrown by accents. So, by the way, I'm going to get my hearing tested, because <laughs> things are happening. People are saying things to me, Ray, you can't hear, you know, so I'm getting it tested, in case any of you have that, that idea. And, uh, and he's, a, he's a man that divorced and remarried. A girl may be 20 years younger than him, I think. I'm not sure about the age, but I know he's a lot older than him, than him, than her. And I can tell by talking to him, because it's like every six months he calls, that he's, he's been reading scripture. And, and, and he's grown in, in word. Because he says, if I, if I go here and if I act this way, my wife treats me better. I said, well, that's good. You must be doing something, something right. He said, but when I go to preach to my relatives, everybody hates me. They, they get yell at me. I said, well, then you must be preaching the truth. Because that's what happens. No, we're the church, the body of Christ, the gospel of grace. Okay? This is what saves today. And he, he's, he's just, I left him with, with, with two words that, that I said, listen, you, you talked about rewards and gifts. God supplied all our need, Philippians 4.19. There's no S on, the, on that, okay? Everybody needs salvation, and God supplied that from the cross work. And then the word reward, okay, Colossians 3.24, it's also singular. Your gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble are going to be, you know, judged, and you're going to get a reward based on what you did in your body for the Lord, not outside. Not buying a house or how much money and this and that. You know, not praying the rosary. It's what, what did you do in your body? What motivated you to do this? And if you give any other question than that, any other name than Jesus Christ, you're thinking wrong. It's Christ in me. You can't take any credit for that. Just thank him. Be thankful for that and get on with your life. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches, all your need. In glory by Jesus Christ. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Need and reward. Okay? And please don't ask me what kind of reward you're going to receive. I have absolutely no idea. I don't even know if I'll receive a reward, but I'll be saved. Okay? That's the great thing. We have that comfort. You can be saved. That souls by fire. Remember the burning bush that didn't burn? It's kind of like that, that principle. Okay, with uh, everything, if we have all bad works, but we're saved, it'll be burned up, but we're going to be saved, yet so is by fire. So what do you have to worry about? Being saved in heaven, do you think it'll be better than down here? I think it'll be better than down here. How about you? Okay, a lot better? Even if you don't get a reward? Yeah. I think so. So why are you, you know, why are you worried about this? So that was part of my weekend. Again, it was nice to hear the growth in him. And when he said, if I act on these verses, my wife treats me better. I said, as well, <clears throat> they get, they mature quicker than we do. You know where I stand on that. If men ever do, right? Ladies. <laughs> They're being nice today. So, the gift of tongues that help people who understood that language, um, sick people got help with it, but prophecy is for everybody, okay? Now, pay attention to edification. Remember what happened to the Thessalonians in the following. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. He's talking about humans, other people, spirit, 
word and letter. He's talking about other people, okay? They were told this information was coming from Paul. They were being lied to from Scripture. Spirit words in the letter, all false. Okay, they were, this is what you get when you preach Pauline truth. The guy from Puerto Rico, he says, why did my family treat, treat me this way? And, I mean, they're, they're Christians, they go to church. I says, if you're getting that kind of flack from your family, you are preaching the truth. That's what happens every single time. That's part of the affliction of the gospel today in the dispensation of grace. What happened to Paul in Asia? What does he say about the people in Asia? All that being Asia left me, right? Except a couple of people. So what difference is there between that time, the first century, and this? We're in the 21st century now, right? This century. Has anything changed? No. When you hold every and when you hold everything anybody teaches as truth, you discount discount the actual truth, which comes from Scripture. So hold fast, prove it from Scripture. It's not me that said it. Here's what the Lord said. This is our final authority. I'm going to show you the verse. And you can read it yourself and believe it or not believe it. It's up to you. Now. Quench not the spirit. When he says don't do it, it implies that you can do it. You can stop the Holy Ghost Spirit from working in you. And First Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as, as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. How do you stop the Holy Spirit? Stop believing. Stop studying. Stop reading. Stop talking to God in your inner man. That's how you quench the Holy Spirit. It's like somebody takes a five-gallon pail and dumps it on your Holy Spirit. You know, that's the fire. They put it out. They extinguish it. You got nothing but smoke. Where does smoke get blown most of the time? Okay? Excuse me for that. But you know what I'm talking about. It's all smoke and mirrors. The, all these, you know, Pentecostal and charismatic. It's, it's, it's fluff. They don't, have the, the, they don't have the edification. Comparing all things to the Word. Compare all things to the Word. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says... Prophecy is a better gift, but tongues is a lesser gift. Can you prove prophecy is real if God gives you six rules to do so? Yes or no? Okay. God gave six rules about prophesying. Let me give you the rules. This is in 1 Corinthians 14. Number one, it's for unbelieving Jews. It says, for the Jew requires a sign. Psalm 74 9 says, we see not our signs. Way back in Psalms, they're a sign nation. They need to see something. Tongues, too, were to edify the church. In fact, go there. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. I want you to read this. Tongues were to edify the church. Look at verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Look at verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Now what happens in groups like Richard was talking about Pentecostal charismatic groups, do you hear a lot of people speaking in tongues? Can you understand anything they say? Is it a language, a known language? Are women doing it? That's the last rule. No woman should be doing that. Let me go on with the other rules here. Edify the church. So you, unbelieving Jews edify the church. No more than three people are to speak in tongues at any 
one meeting. That should be separate. Any one single meeting. Now, if you've been to charismatic churches, are more than three people doing this? Is there anybody interpreting what that person is saying except the person himself? If there's no interpreter there, you know it's not of God. If there's more than three people chattering away, you know it's not from God. Okay? If, it's, you know, if you know it's not edifying the church, you know it's not from God. They made up their own gobbledygook, and they, they, think, they think there's something. Number four, each person of the three is to wait their turn. Have you ever seen people like that? In a charismatic church or Pentecostal church, I'm not knocking. The, I'm, I'm knocking the practice. Tongues is no longer here. It stopped after the final revelation given to Paul was the final words of God to mankind. Second Timothy two. But after Acts twenty eight, nothing miraculous is happening except to Paul, who was a prophet. Okay, one person is to interpret. If God gave the tongue, He would have provide the interpreter. Only men were to speak in tongues. Okay? Verse 35. 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. This has nothing to do with the quality or the character of a woman. Just the order that God wants to see. Verse 3, 35. And if they will learn anything... Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I'm talking about tongues now, okay? But let me continue this. What? Came the word of God off from you? Or came it unto you only? That woman that came here? I'm spirit-filled and born again since I'm five years old. Can you show me the verse with your name in it? Show me a verse with your name that says God told me this. And also want the year, month, another, you know, month and day in the year. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Debbie asked me yesterday, is there a verse in the Bible where it just it says prophet that Paul's a prophet? I said, I brought it to this one, and I said, this one shows he's the prophet. But No, I want prophet, singular. Well, you can't find it, but you get things like this, you know he's, he's a prophet. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. God's going to give you what you want. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak tongues, that all things be done decently and in order. So in other words, God is not the author of confusions. What you have is these Pentecostal charismatic churches and whatever they do there, it's confusion. It's not edification. They're, they're, they're operating on emotion. And when you get saved, you have a lot of emotion. Craig back there, he's, he's teaching himself by watching other people. You know, you know Oh, and that's how you learn. You know what I mean? You learn how to fight with people. He's getting a lot of negative people talking to him, but he wants to know how to answer them better. I said, that's one of the first things you do when you first get saved. You watch the 700 Club or stuff, Jack Van Impey or something like that. He says, that guy's not, that, that's not right. Because you finally know from Scripture that there, there's a lot of duplicitous conduct going on in the church. And you can, now that you understand, now that your mind's been open, your heart's been open, more so, now you can see it. Wait a minute. How come, how come Pat Robertson told a woman who didn't receive a hundredfold, you know, that she must be hiding something from God? How can you hide something from God? Where's the verse? Please show me the verse. He's worth a billion dollars, but who, yeah, he didn't get it from God. He's just a smart businessman. I mean, my God. Come on. The truth of God's word. 
crowds out the false. Second Timothy 1 6 says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the parting uh, by the putting on of my hands. Now and if this happened when they put the hands on Timothy, it was during the Acts period. These things were going on. Miracles and signs and wonders. Because the Jew required the sign. In the first in, in the book of Acts, he's trying to get the people to realize that the first part the first half is mostly about Peter and the fall, the spiritual fall. Then Paul comes on the scene in chapter 9, and from verse 15 on, you know, it's Paul. It's a Paul show. There's a transition. Israel is given a year, a year to see whether or not that the leaders would believe that Jesus Christ was Messiah. And they didn't. And they, instead of the prophesied wrath, we'll talk about in Matthew 12, he ushered in the dispensation of grace, which was a mystery. Only known by God the Father, God, God the Son knew it sometime too. But today, Timothy, Timothy, Timothy could not get a, get a miracle. Today, you have to study. You have to stir them up. Second Timothy one seven to eight. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as preacher, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. Guess what? You're going to be afflicted. And if any one of you come up to me and tell me, you know, I was talking to this group of people, and they started getting angry. Christians, they shouldn't be that way. Well, if you're preaching Paul, they're going to be that way. They don't know Paul. I know you must have preached to them the truth. You don't have to tell me. I can't number the times it's happened to me in person or in, uh, over the phone or, or, and all that, you know. But, you know, you, you tend to get a little... I thought maybe, maybe Timothy was depressed. Maybe he had a bump in the road in his life. Now, if you're a young preacher, Timothy was a young man. You have to be very careful how you treat the older people. Right? Okay? Very careful. I won't mention names. Okay? You have to keep your sense of humor, too. But very careful. Because when you get older, you know, well, I, I, you know you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, I graduated from college when I was 28 years old. I didn't make the high school graduation because I was down on credit. I went to summer school, made it up, and then and went on to the war. Came back, and one of the things I studied when I was in college was gerontology, the study of aging. Okay. In the Bible, there is no teenage rebellion. What do they say about the teenagers today? I got a two and a half year old back there. This is he he controls the whole room. He does something in his diapers, and it's got to be taken care of. And you got to do it right away and put some cream on it, too. So it won't happen again, you know. Two feet tall, not even two feet tall. He's, he's, he's controlling the whole, whole realm, right? Aren't kids lovely? It's a good thing they're cute. So, I had the pleasure of going, when I started to go to Shorewood, when I started grade school, the Bible at 43, I've seen some young men. They were they were young. Charlie, he was like seven or eight years old, and now he's married, got five kids. I had the the opportunity to see these young men grow into adulthood and not have any problem in the teenage years, because you don't have to have that if you have the message, if you have the truth. And I was just stupefied. I think, they're that old and they're acting like this? Jeez, I, I'm glad I don't have to tell you what I was doing at that age. 
You know, you know what I mean? Because we had nothing. And I've seen this with my own eyes. It's one of the benefits, I feel, of getting, getting saved. All were upstanding men, married, kids, etc. Then I remember an old saying um, I've heard. There's an old saying, that, an old expression about getting old. Youth is wasted on the young. If I had known then what I know now, things would be a lot different. Right? Let's go back to the outline. You can put the fire out in the assembly if you neglect feeding them sound doctrine. There is no autopilot. That's why prayer, unceasing, is essential. Live in the conscious, live in the conscious reality of who you are in Christ. Walk by faith in the details of your life. Neglect not, stir up, be fervent in the spirit, Romans 12, 11 says. And there's other ways to quench the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Acts 7.51, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Isaiah 6.33.10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit can be grieved, resisted, and vexed, this shows us that the Holy Spirit is a person. He does not like to talk about himself, but it is important to know who he is. John fourteen sixteen says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now the word comforter is used six times in the Bible. The word advocate in 1 John 2, 1 is the same word as comfort. And I give you the verses there. The pronouns are, here are he and his, you know, in, in, in the Greek, the Holy Spirit is normally treated as neutral in the Greek. But here he's specified as a comfort, as a comforter, okay? Okay. He's coming to replace another person. He's the comforter, but the import, the important word here is another comforter. He's coming to replace another person. That would be Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit of God has knowledge. He can search and he can reveal truth. People can do that. All these characteristics are characteristics of a person. Revelation 3, 6 says, The Spirit saith unto the churches, The Holy Spirit speaks. Galatians 4, 6, Like Jesus, the Spirit speaks, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 26, The Spirit maketh intercession, like Jesus does in Romans 8, 34, who maketh, also maketh intercession for us. Romans 15, 30, for the love of the Spirit, you get, get the point here. He is a person. He can love or be grieved. He does things people do. He intercedes. He gives testimony. Speaks, teaches. He is a person outside of the Father and Son. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Deuteronomy 6.4, this is a good one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, the Hebrew word there, ikad, means compound unity versus yashid. Okay? 
The doctrine of the Trinity. How many of you have been yelled at for believing in the Trinity? We're spirit, soul, and body, right? We're three-partite? Well, some people just think we're two-partite. We're three-partite, right? says that. The word Trinity, like rapture, is not found in Scripture, but is definitely revealed and illustrated. The Holy Spirit is not the Father dressed up in a different costume. They are three persons, the Trinity, with three different roles in the Godhead. 1 John 5, 7, that a lot of newer Bibles take out, it says, For there are three persons, there are three that bear the, the record in heaven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. A lot of newer Bibles take that first out. Somebody wrote something that thick about that it should be in there. You know, what does it say in John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And the word became flesh. Capital. So there was God. In the beginning of the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You just can't, I mean, go to Hebrews chapter, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I think this part is taken out of Catholic Bibles. Let me start at verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Okay, Jesus Christ talking to the Father. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of his body, of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How many priests are there on Sunday mornings doing the Eucharist thing? You know, sacrifice. You, you, we, they put a piece of bread on your tongue if you want to take communion. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which, which can never take away sins. How many rosaries do you have to pay to get any effect on anybody or anything? How many candles do you have to light? How much candy can you not eat to please the Lord on Lent? I mean, come on. But this man, after he had offered for once one, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, one sacrifice for sins, plural, forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them which are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, the Father wills, the Son works, and the Holy Spirit witnesses, the Holy Ghost. On your outline here, the Godhead is only used by Paul, the word Godhead. You find it in Acts 17.29, Romans 1.20, and Colossians 2.9. Paul's the only person that uses the word Godhead. As I mentioned before, the Trinity is shown in many, many verses. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's, that's three there. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, 
but he is the same God which worketh in all. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Plurality. They go as one. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. How many of you know the difference, or if there's a difference between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? I want you to go to Acts chapter 5. Remember now, Acts is a transition book. Still talking about Jews here. Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Now, they sold a possession. They only said they lied about the money they got. And he kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hast thou, I'm sorry, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now you see these tables here we have to break down? Can I lie to a table? No. How can you lie to an inanimate object? He said he lied to the Holy Ghost. He's a person. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. This is an inanimate object. The clock here. Can I lie to this? I can change the time if I want. Make you think it's a different time, but I can't lie to it. It doesn't talk back. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me just read you 13 and 14. Let me start at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, that's capital S, for the Spirit, capital S, searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the Spirit? It's the smallness of man. We have a human spirit, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit of a man, which is in him. So if we didn't have our spirit, we couldn't know these things. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God, capital S, again. Now we are received, not the spirit of the, of the world, it's called the present evil world, that's the overwhelming spirit, but the spirit which is, which is of God. In other words, God gave us spirit. We're born with an old sin nature, and at one point in our life, when we get older, we have to believe in something or not to get saved. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Think about all those churches out there speaking in tongues, not edifying anybody. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural true man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, that's the unsaved man, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. God, when you got saved, you were quickened, you were made alive spiritually. We're already alive physically, but you're made alive spiritually. That one guy I was talking to about, he said we didn't have a sin nature. You, you can't get past Ephesians 2, 1. We're quickened by the Spirit. If you're already living, what does that mean? It's got to be a spiritual thing. So you got the difference in the ghost and the spirit. You could say that the Holy Ghost would be the person and the spirit would be the influence. But it's interchangeable. But that's 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 what I, I thought, you know, because I looked up, you know, he, he lied to the Holy Spirit, but you go to uh, Hebrews 10, the Spirit teaches, you know, the influence. Luke 3, 21 and 22. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and in thee I am well pleased. There's the Trinity. 
You can see the Holy Ghost. He must be a person. Person. He's not one of these tables floating down from heaven or one of these chairs. He's a person floating down. You can see him. Ephesians 2.18 For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The only way to the Father is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we have access by one spirit. Access is a word meaning to have contact and use to introduce. The Holy Spirit gives us access he gives us the connection. Guess what? How many times do you think the word, you probably read the paper, access is used in scripture? That's a pretty common word. I'll give you one guess. How many times do you think it's used? The word accessed. I'll give you a guess. Anybody? Three, Three times. How'd you get that? that way <laughs> three times and only Paul uses it you know there's certain things that only Paul says it's, it's just it's mind-boggling access is the Pauline word there's no other dispensation we can go to and get access only in this dispensation Romans 5 1 and 2 here's the other two times it's used Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith, because we trust in the faith of Christ, like Rick was saying, all right? By faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Ephesians 3, 10 to 12. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers and heavenly places, might be known by the church, that's the church of the body of Christ, the angels that are looking down here, seeing what's transpiring down there, the manifold wisdom of God, the many folds, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. That's what Rick was preaching. The faith of Christ. So those are the three times we use access. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians, I mean, Psalms 139. <coughs> Psalms 139, and let me see, um, Acts 17. I want you to see these two verses. Just bear with me a little while longer. In Psalm 139, David's real, he says he, 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 you can't hide from God, all right? You can't hide from the Lord. Let me start reading Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and, and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for, wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? Where can I go to hide from God? How can you hide a sin from God? If I ascend up into the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Remember in time past, hell was in two compartments? Okay? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy, wor are thy works, and there is my soul, knoweth the right will. My substance is not hid from thee when I, when I made when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect in thy book, all my members.
words were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now if you think of that, then you go to Acts 17, like there was no, nothing David could say or do or hide or any, or keep secret. God knew it all. But in Acts 17, he started at verse 25. Verse 24. For God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heavens and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. That's why you see these big cathedrals. Oh, they, they build these big churches. They're thinking they're doing God a favor or honoring, or, you know, they're taking other people's money to do that. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things, I think God needs a temple. And I think it's got to be around $5 million. Let's see how much money I can raise, how big of a steeple I can put up for the guy. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. So what's good for David is good for us. We, we can't hide from God. For to dwell on, the, on all the face of the earth, and 